Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to get to it this morning. It is now 11 o'clock. Would you stand with me? And we're going to read the Word of God. Why do you stand when you read the Word of God? It's just in honor of the Word of God. Honor for the Word of God. And I have a tremendous amount of Scripture today, so I'm not going to make you stand for all of it. But uh, I do want to read a couple of things in your hearing today. I'm going to go to Exodus 3, and then I'm going to go to Joshua chapter 1. But Exodus 3, verses 7 and 8, I'm using New King James Version. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Everybody say, God knows my sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up. Isn't it cool? He came down to bring you up. Amen? From that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I love it. I love it. Before he ever... you got to understand, this is the event at the burning bush. Moses has been on the backside of a desert for 40 years because he thought he had messed his life up. And God couldn't use him. And after 40 years of feeling pitiful, God shows up in the form of a burning bush and begins to speak to Moses and tells Moses, I've put you out here to set you apart because I'm going to use you to deliver my people out from where they are to a land that I have already given to them. We're 40 years away from them getting what God said that he had already given them. Even though there's a 40-year span, he said it's already yours. Joshua chapter 1, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, And you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel, verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given. Everybody say, have given. Past tense. Everybody say, past tense. Everybody say, already done. Everybody say, it is finished. I have given you, as I said, to Moses. Amen? I have no idea what I'm going to preach about today, but I'm about to do it. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of the Word. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3, it says, as His divine power has given, everybody say has given, everybody say past tense, everybody say already done, everybody say it is finished. Come on, I'm going to get this in your brain. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given. Everybody say, have been given. Do we need to go through it all, or are you getting it today? Have been given. uh, Past tense, come on. Already done. It is finished. Having been given, he said here, uh, all these things have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through what? Promises, that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Somebody say amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 say this, And we desire, Paul said, that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Come on, somebody. 
Paul said he was writing and he was concurring with Peter. Peter said we have been given, already given, all these great, exceedingly uh, great and, and precious promises. And then Paul tells the, the Hebrews, he said, what I need you to do is not become sluggish until it happens. In other words, don't get sluggish between the promise and the performance, but hang in there and imitate those who through faith and patience inherit these promises. Everybody's still with me. I want you to understand this morning that I'm on an assignment. And I pray today for wisdom and I pray for strength. I pray for power today to fulfill my purpose because I believe God has spoken something directly into my spirit. I have been given a direction to move the body of the refuge. I, I must say, maybe I should say it like this I have been given a directive to move the body of the of the refuge. My directive in my spirit, what I have heard God saying to me in my prayer time is, as a shepherd, as a leader, as a spiritual guide, as someone who is watching for the lives of the people who I have put in your care, you have a responsibility, Larry, to get up and preach to them until they move out of complacency, until they move out of stagnation, until they move out of dullness of mind and spirit, until they move away from non-participation gospel to a full participation gospel. Well, thank you for the... That a little light applause. Amen. I'm going to try not to be distracted today. We have a world around us that is screaming in agony, begging for some relief. The Word of God declares in Romans chapter 8, and I, and I apologize to those of you who, uh, if you think I'm being redundant, I am going to preach this until God gets up off me. So if I have to do it a hundred different ways, I'm going to do it a hundred different ways until we get it in this assembly because this is, this is the word of the hour for the kingdom of God. But the, the Bible plainly declares in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 21, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The Bible says that the world right now is groaning, waiting for some relief. And the relief that the world is waiting for is going to come from the sons of God. So who are the sons of God? If you back up in Romans 8 to, to verse number 14, it says, For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I am doing really good right now whether you realize it or not. If you, the world is waiting to be delivered, the world is waiting for somebody to rise up and to bring some healing to our world. And the Bible says that the world is looking to the sons of God to do this. And the Word also says that the sons of God are those who are filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit. You're a son of God if you're led by the Spirit. You cannot be led by the Spirit if you're not full of the Spirit. Come on. And Paul said that the answer to what was ailing the world or what is ailing the world of our day is the same answer as what was to what was ailing the world of his day. And the answer is a people who realize that our world is in pain and we can no longer, as believers, do our own thing. Woo. Ain't nobody listening. I'm going to start the clock now. That's about 10 minutes late. Paul said, I know the answer for what's ailing my world. And what was ailing his world is the same thing that's ailing our world. And Paul said, the thing that the world needs is a people who will realize that they are not their own, but they belong to God. A people who will no longer live 
unto themselves but will live unto the principles of the kingdom of God. I have been assigned to this place today to do a roll call and see if there are some people who understand and recognize this morning that your life is not your own and while you are waiting on Jesus to come back and fix everything, your world is waiting on you to reveal yourself for who you claim to be and understand that your body, your voice, your hands, your feet, your gift, your energy, everything else about you is not yours but it is God's to be used as a tool to advance the kingdom in the day and the hour in which we live. The kingdom is supposed to overtake the earth. Swing low. Listen, somebody hear me today. If you profess to be full of the Spirit, then wherever you are in your life right now is kingdom assignment. I'm not going to tell it like it is. Wherever you are right now in your life is kingdom assignment. It is more than a job. It's more than a business that you operate. It's more than just a temporary position or circumstance or a class you're taking at college or at school. Where you are right now, wherever that may be, is a kingdom opportunity so that what you profess to possess can permeate the atmosphere of your sphere of influence until where you are has been saturated by what you have. I want to change the world, Larry. I want to change the world. I want to change the world. But you don't want to minister to anybody that you're around on a daily basis. Ain't nobody talking to me in here today. You want to change the world. You want to change the world. You want to go somewhere and change the world. You want to be a missionary somewhere. You're always looking yonder, 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 yonder. You're looking to Congress. You're looking to the Senate. You're looking to the House. You're looking to this. You're looking to that. And God is saying, you can't affect all of that out there. But what you can change is the world that you live in every day. And where you live every day should be permeated with what you say you have. I'm not doing any good here today. I mean, I know I am. I just want to make sure you're still on board. I'm not deceived. Hallelujah. Stay with me. If there, listen, here we go. People are crazy. That's deep revelation right there. I think there's a country song, something to that effect. God is good, ice cream is great. And people are crazy. I think that's kind of how that song goes. But something like that. People are people are nutbags. People do crazy stuff. And and here's what Christian people do. Well, I will be so glad when the refuge get to the place that Larry can hire everybody to work for the refuge because I just want to work in a Christian environment. Can I tell you that some of the things that happen in the office of the refuge aren't very Christian? Come on, hallelujah. Come on, everybody. You know, I know. Oh, my God. Everybody, oh, if I could just work for the church. Oh, if I could just work for a missionary. If I tell you, Larry, I could be as strong as you in the Lord if I could just be around people every day, all day, who just love Jesus, spoke in tongues all day long, fell on the floor, rolled in the aisle, whatever you do. Boy, I could really be a humdinger for Christ. Have you ever given consideration to the fact that if you are still, if there are still people on your job in darkness, that is your assignment? Ain't nobody talking to me today. Hallelujah. If there are still people on your job every day who don't know Jesus Christ, you don't need to be in a Christian environment. You need to be showing Christ to those who don't know Jesus Christ. 
if there are still people in your neighborhood or in your apartment complex or even in your own house who have not been changed, then your assignment where you are has not been finished. Stop wishing for another place and begin to be who God told you to be right here and right now. Woo! Well, Larry, I just don't know, Larry. That's your problem. I'm telling you. You're thick. Turn around. Don't drown. Oh, I think I can make it. Come on. Don't go this way. Road out. But I live down there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you, man. I just don't know what my assignment is. I just told you what your assignment is. If you're filled with the Spirit, if you say that you are led by the Spirit, your assignment right now is not to get on a plane and go to Africa. Your assignment is to declare the whole counsel and the love of God to everybody you touch on a daily basis so that lives in Sherman and Denison and Texoma can be changed. Why are you worried? when there are people next door to you who are dying without Jesus. <laughs> this is all just foundation. I'm trying to build something here. I just don't know what my calling is, Larry. I do. I guarantee if I had a Wednesday night class on telling you your calling, we would have more people than are in here right now. In fact, I think I'll do that. June the 10th, I'm going to tell you all your calling, so everybody come. I want to give you a heads up. It's going to sound a lot like what I'm telling you right now. Because your calling is your salt in the earth. doctors put me on a low sodium diet that's what's wrong I'm telling you that's what's wrong the church has been put on a low sodium diet nothing we're preaching anymore has the, has the power to preserve or change anything People come in lost, leave lost. Come in bound, leave bound. Come in addicted, leave addicted. Come in sick, leave sick. The church preaches over and over and over again on Sunday. Get your money straight, get your money straight, get your honey straight, get your honey straight. It's all coming to you, it's all coming to you. And everybody leaving out sick and dying. Because nobody wants to be salty. That's why you got to come to a church like this. Because if you're not careful, Larry might let a curse word slip every now and then. Not really. You'll, that's the only thing you'll hear. I've never done that. But somebody will hear that today. You've got to be salty. You've got to be salty. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a salty person, Larry. Good. Then I know what your calling is, too. Your calling is to be light. I can't be salt, Larry. Okay, be light. Be light. Isn't it amazing? If we didn't have little kids right there, I'd turn every light in this building off right now. Y'all hear some screaming? There'd probably be some kids get saved back there this morning. Look. Larry, I just, I'm, I, listen, I'm so sick of hearing this. Larry, you've just been at this longer than us. You just kind of got it, you, you know, Larry, and I don't have as much light as you have. How many of you have ever been in a dark movie theater and that one knucklehead phone goes off?
One light on one of these little bad boys lights up an entire theater, and everybody in the theater looks to where the light is, and it's not hard to identify whose phone just got. Even the ushers know. Come on, hallelujah. Don't worry, we're not one of those churches. Hallelujah. You don't have to have a whole lot of light. You just have to have enough light to shine. And if you've got enough light to shine, you've got enough light to penetrate darkness. Because where you are in light may be really, really dark. And it doesn't take a whole lot of light to illuminate that darkness. So your calling is to be salt and your calling is to be light. Your calling is to be a city set on a hill to not be hidden. A little history here. The reason Jesus is talking about a city set on a hill that can't be hid is because salt was a commodity in Jesus' day. And there was a group of people who didn't want other people to have salt. And so they went to these caves outside the Dead Sea and they created their own colony because they wanted a corner market on salt. And they created their own colony in the caves in the mountains outside the Dead Sea. And they mined salt at night. Because they didn't want other people to know that they could go there and get salt. But what they didn't understand was in order to mine salt at night, you needed light. (laughs) And so when it was dark and they lit their candles and began to mine salt, it couldn't be hid what they were doing. Come on, people. Help me out here this morning. We will get out of here real quick. Listen, it, it is time that the church quit trying to hide what we're doing. Come on, everybody. It doesn't matter how dark you think this world is or how bad you think our direction or leadership is. You have a job. Woo! Got quiet in here today. You know that it was dark and people didn't like the leadership in Paul's day? Paul lived under the Roman Empire, the rule of the Roman Empire. And when Paul was in his heyday, the ruler of the Roman Empire was a man named Nero. Nero is highly regarded as one of the most vile and wicked leaders of all time. See if this doesn't sound like modern day, like, not person, see if it doesn't sound like culture of modern day. Because what Nero focused his attention on mainly was on diplomacy, trade, and the enhancement of cultural life. People were starving and dying, and Nero built theaters and promoted athletic games, all for his own benefit and his own entertainment. Is anybody still here with me? In 64 A.D., the great fire of Rome happened, and it is widely held and believed that Nero is the one who ordered the fire to be set in the first place because Nero wanted to build himself a more expansive palatial complex, so he needed to burn down the infrastructure to build bigger for himself. Ain't nobody talking now. Because some of y'all thought what we're going through in, in our world, all over the world right now, is just for us. Hold on. Tyranny and extravagance are what historians remember Nero for. Watch this. You think we got it bad right now? Listen to what I'm telling you. Nero, the emperor of Rome, the ruler in Paul's day, had his own mother and stepbrother executed. Because he viewed them as a threat to his power. Nero is known as the emperor who fiddled while Rome burned. Man, I'm preaching good. It's quiet, but I'm preaching good. Watch this. This Now, come on. Come on. All you weak-kneed people, come on. Nero captured Christians and then had them dipped in oil and then had them set on fire in his garden at night to be used as sources of light so he could see how to walk the paths of his garden. Come on, people. Come on. 
Nero was involved in an adulterous affair with his friend's wife. And when he discovered that she was pregnant with his second child, Nero kicked her to death. After he kicked her to death, he was responsible for driving another man to suicide in order to marry that man's wife. And when that man's wife didn't satisfy him, he found a former slave, a young man who had a resemblance to the wife that he had kicked to death, and he ordered that young man who had been a slave, he ordered him to be castrated, and then he married that man. And you think we got it bad. Why are you telling us all that, Larry? Because I'm telling was in that environment that Paul stood up and said, I don't want to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I say to the church at the refuge, there's enough darkness around that we could all be upset. But what I tell you is rise and be a light in this darkness. If Paul could turn the world upside down, we can too. hear me today, wickedness and vile human behavior and governmental corruption have been around ever since man became his own God way back in the garden. And the only thing that has ever turned the tide has been a people who understood, like Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul understood this. He, he said this, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money and boasters and proud and blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, haughty, strong-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of, deni of godliness but denying the power thereof from such people. Turn away. Paul said, yes, it's going to be dark and yes, it is going to be bad. But there are a people who are salt and light in the earth who are kingdom-minded who know that their lives are not their own and will stand up and be who God has called us to be so we can turn the tide. I say to every professing, spirit-filled, spirit-led person in this house today, what the psalmist said in 107 and 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy because as believers our calling is not to gather inside buildings and hide from the world and wait on the Jesus jet to come get us out of here I know I'm making some of you upset today. I don't intend to do that. I really don't. But I am telling you, I am sick of being a part of a group of people that want to hide behind walls and just come get us Jesus, come get us Jesus, come get us Jesus. When the people we say we love are going to be lost if we don't get out there and begin to touch them with the power of the gospel wherever you go, on your job, in the AA hall, at an NA meeting, uh, down at the hospital, on the coffee store, at the, at the bank somewhere, you can be light in a dark world you just need to start doing it it's time to stop scaring the world with left behind and realize that what and who is around me is in bondage, waiting on me and groaning for a change that because of my position in the kingdom as a son, I have the authority to initiate. But I'm helping people sell movies and books trying to scare the hell out of people. You can't scare hell out of people. We tried that in 1988. 
when the guy wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming, in 1988. And he wrote the book, and while he wrote the book, he was making speaking engagement appearances for 1989. True story. Promoting fear, not even believing what he was saying. And we had churches filled with people running because he, it's coming, it's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, and he's coming in September. And he's coming September the 9th at the end of Rosh Hashanah. I remember on September the 9th in Houston, Texas, 7803 Uvalde Road, uh, the, the church that I was a part of was filled to overflowing capacity, and people were screaming and crying on the ground, don't leave me, Jesus, don't leave me, Jesus. He didn't leave them. And when they realized he hadn't left them, they got right back up and went back to what they were doing because fear doesn't bring real change. Come on, somebody. What will bring real change is when you can sit down with somebody and tell them your story. I was in darkness, but he brought me out. I was addicted to meth. I was addicted to crack cocaine. I was addicted to alcohol, but one day God got a hold of my life. Man, I was addicted to men. I was addicted to women. I was addicted to women and men. Do not edit that and put that out anywhere because you need to, the whole context of what I just said. Some of you are going to take that one sound bite and say, Larry said he was addicted to women and men. I know how this church operates. Hallelujah. Listen to what I'm telling you here today. The world, the world in, in darkness is looking for people who can speak their language. The world is looking for people at a pregnancy care center. Young girls coming in scared, don't know what to do, that can look at somebody who's walked the, talk, walked the walk and talked the talk, lived to tell about it, got a life that is blessed and purpose, and can say, this can be yours too. That's what will change life. The, the world is not looking for sad sob stories and just hang on, baby Jesus, it's going to come. But what do I do in the meantime? Anybody ever wonder why they call it the meantime? Come on, people. What do I do in the meantime? What do I do when life is beating me and battering me and pushing me around and I don't know what to do? What do you do in the meantime? You get with somebody who's made it through the meantime. You get with somebody who is salt and light. But if everybody who is salt and light is trying to punch their ticket for the Jesus jet, then nobody who's in darkness is going to hear what the people in light have to say. But I declare to the refuge, rise up in Jesus' name. Rise up in Jesus' name. You have been healed. You have been called. You have been set apart for such a time as this right here. Every, I know everybody doesn't like my style of preaching. Well, thank you. You and me could probably start a church. Listen, I am in position to initiate change. In World War II, paratroopers you know the reason for paratroopers? It wasn't just so that you could go to white right and skydive. Hello. In fact, I just want to tell you something. If you do that, there's something a little off. It took me long enough to get on an airplane. I'm sure not jumping out of a good one. Amen. Hello. The reason for paratroopers... And they came to prominence in World War II was because the people leading the assault and the attack, the attack understood that if we can get men silently behind enemy lines, we can gain an advantage on the enemy before they ever even know we're there. So the planes would fly high enough that the noise could hardly be detected, but the guys... Anybody ever heard of D-Day? Before guys ever stormed the beach, there were guys being dropped behind enemy lines. Come on, somebody. 
because they were trying to gain vantage points and let the guys who were storming the beach know the tactical places that they needed to be to secure the victory. How many of you understand that the reason you and I have been left here in this world and not gone on the Jesus jet yet is so that we can gain advantage on the enemy from behind his own lines and do damage to him? He, he won't even know what's hit him, but while we are behind enemy lines, I can tell you, hey, watch that pothole. Hey, watch out. He's going to try to get you right there. Hey, watch out. That's going to subdue you right there. I can help you if I initiate what's in me. Am I doing any good here today? Can I finish? Let me finish. See, look. The only place that light is ever an advantage is in darkness. I remember when we first moved into this building, I had my office right on the other side of that wall. And I used to come up here late at night, especially on Saturday nights. And I'd come up here late at night and I'd lock myself in and I'd walk through the building and I would pray. And I would just kind of clear my mind for what was going to happen the next day. Um, as you know, we're kind of jacked up here. Every light in the building's on one switch. And so in order to keep you know, the lights from all being on, I had lamp, plug-in lamps in my office. And so I would plug the lamps in and I would kind of like this and wait. And like when all these lights are on in here, and if I, if I were to come in here right now and put my lamp in here, you wouldn't hardly be able to notice my lamp because of all the other light. But when there's no other light in this building, my lamp's pretty bright. And one night, I'm sitting in my office pretty late and I hear some noise outside and uh, I, I'm, I'm just sitting there and I'm trying to own some things I'm going to be honest with you I have been known to scream like a girl <sighs> I'm just trying to own that <laughs> and for the rest of you that haven't I've, uh, you lie you lie Roseanne and I love watching those YouTube videos where those big tough guys get scared and they scream like girls and fall down and they start to fight. And we love that. But I was sitting up there in the office and we had blackout curtains on the windows because they're the big plate glass windows and the blackout curtains so people couldn't see that my computer and all the other stuff was in there. And so we had those. And I heard some noise and I had my door shut and I stepped outside the door and the parking lot and everything at that time says, if you come by here at certain times of night, all the lights in the complex are completely out. It was really bright. And when I opened the door, I looked out across where I thought I heard the noise coming from. And over at the car wash, Ray, you remember when we first moved in across the street? On Sunday mornings, people would drive, drive over there and do that car wash, and it used to have that horn on it. Honk, honk! Every time somebody pulled through the car wash. We'd be right in the middle of, I love you, I love you. Honk, honk. When you're the refuge, you just roll with it. Fred learned how to hit that key on our keyboard. Just keep moving. But we're, I, I knew it wasn't the horn of the car wash, but I heard a lot of noise. And I stepped out into the foyer out there. And I looked over there, and there was a huge fight going on. A bunch of people. And I mean, they were fighting. And they had the, the wands and the hoses from the car wash. And they were slinging them at each other and punching. They got people down on the ground and they're kicking them. And they're stomping on each other. And he's kind of watching them. It's about measuring. thought, I need to go in my office and get my phone. Because at that time, we didn't have phone here either. I was just I was using my cell phone. We didn't have phones here. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> but uh, I went to get my cell phone because I thought, you know, I'm not one to generally call the popo. <laughs> Haven't had a lot of great experiences. <laughs> so, <laughs> just my personal, I'm not, calm down. But <laughs> anyway, 
I thought, man, I might need to get some help over here because there's about 40 of them and there's one of me. And about that time, I had my phone in my hand and I'm looking out across the parking lot and I forget that everything is dark except the light in my office. And now somebody at the car wash is looking at me. I have to tell you, I'm not feeling real good right now. Because what I found out on that night, <laughs> as I screamed like a girl and ran to my car, I don't even know if I locked the building that night. I just left, man. But what I realized that night was that one 60-watt bulb was like a spotlight. I'm, I'm hurrying. I'm, I'm done. You'll live, trust me. You've been to concerts longer than this and worse than this. Hallelujah. In fact, if you've been to one at Choctaw, you don't even know what I'm talking about. The only place that light has an advantage is in darkness. It doesn't have to be a million watts. What you've got will work if it's dark enough. I have been designed to change, not escape my environment. Greater is he who is in me. I am not intimidated by my environment because I am a king's kid. Come on, musician. My father has defeated the devil. I want to say to every person in here, you don't have to worry about beating the devil. The devil has already been defeated. I don't believe that, Larry. Well, you better believe it because Revelation 12, 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, he who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. There was a war in heaven, and it lasted that long. And God defeated the devil. Your battle is not to get up and beat the devil more every day. The devil can't be beat any more than he's already been beat. The victory has already been established. The war has already been won. God is just looking for some people who will say, I will occupy what you have already won for me. Y'all aren't getting this, I can tell, because three are clapping. He said that old serpent was defeated and cast out. And then the Bible says in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents. Y'all not talking to me today. The old serpent was cast out, and now you've been given authority. Your freedom from addiction has already been won. needs to change is your mind. Hello, somebody. Man, I got, oh. Come here. You know, I'll get quiet. You better get quiet. Come on, preacher. I, I'm not going to hurt you, I promise. All right, come on now. Paul said this. Watch this. I'm, I'm done. Y'all can play. You, you can play hallelujah chorus. You can Play something to stomp the devil, you know, whatever you want. Just don't play Amazing Grace. That'll kind of kill the mood. <laughs> All right. All right. Paul said this. If you're looking for reference to what I'm going to tell you as I close here, here's what Paul said. Watch this. Remember all that stuff I had you repeat at the beginning? Already done. Has been given. Past tense. It is finished. But Paul said this, Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 20 through 25, somewhere around there. He said, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Go ahead. 
he, Paul said, I delight in the law of God according to the inward, inward man, talking about his spirit. Man, my spirit loves the law of God. How many of you know that when you got saved, it wasn't your flesh or your mind that was saved, it was your spirit that was saved? My spirit got saved. And Tony, when my spirit got saved, my spirit liked getting saved. Woo. Thank God my spirit is saved. But what I found out two days after my spirit got saved is my body and my mind didn't agree. My body and my mind kind of liked what they were doing. And Paul said, my inner man likes the law of God. But I see another law. I see another law in my flesh. And the law in my flesh doesn't agree with the law I like in my spirit. And both of them bad dudes are warring against the law in my mind. Telling you is that this everybody say spirit, spirit, flesh, mind, spirit, flesh, mind, spirit, flesh, mind, spirit, flesh, mind, spirit, flesh, flesh, flesh. I know he's about to do that. I know he's about to do that. Spirit, flesh, mind. And this scripture is telling me. can be made captive by spirit flesh, flesh, flesh. Mind. Mind. mind got any handcuffs how about an ankle monitor no I'm just kidding I'm just don't take that off don't take it. just kidding calm down Nobody in this church that they got a tie. <laughs> so what? Mind can be held captive by either. Flesh, 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 or spirit. <laughs> wretched man who will deliver me from all of this Romans chapter 8 verse 5 watch this watch this Romans chapter 8 for those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on things of flesh but those who live according to the spirit have their things set on the We told them on Wednesday night, we can no longer sing that song in this church that I'm going to the enemy camp and I'm taking back what he stole from me. Okay, can you tell me where the enemy camp is? The only people that can sing that song is if they know where the enemy camp is. The enemy camp. The battle for you to win between your ears. And the Bible says that those who live according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit mind the things of the spirit. Another scripture said that to who you yield yourself a servant, that's whose slave you're going to become. what the word yield means it means that you have to give something else the right way I am preaching really good come on I'm coming home to you sorry Rosanna I have something to say I'm coming home to you to who you yield yourself servants 
That's who you're going to obey, and that's whose slave you're going to become. So your mind is going to become the slave of either And when you're on the highway, turn, I have to what? Why? Because this has the right of way. Everybody still here? Who you yield yourself to I need four spirit people. Come on, hurry. I don't have time. Rosanna's keeping the clock on me. People need to work with me. Four spirit people. There you go. There you go. Four. Right there. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Carlene, you can come. That's good. Yeah. See? See what Patty's doing? She's trying to say, do I be spirit or do I be flesh? Do I be spirit or do I be flesh? So come on over here. We'll let you be flesh. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come here, mind. Come here, mind. Come here, mind. My mind is where the battlefield is. And my mind has to yield to something. And the way that it's supposed to yield is to the area. The way that your mind will yield is to the area in your life that has the most traffic. So come over here. Start walking slow, man. Just start walking. Over there. My mind is moving. And flesh wants to get in because if flesh gets in, flesh can control my mind and make me do things that I don't really want to do. But the only way that flesh can get in is if there's a break in the traffic of the spirit. Ain't nobody hearing what I'm telling you. So if you keep the traffic flow in your mind in the things of the spirit, the flesh will never have an entrance point. Am I making any sense? That's why you need to be filled with the spirit. So your mind can be transformed by the power of God. Because if you will keep your mind on things of Christ, the world and your flesh will not have an opportunity to control your mind. Stand with me. Hear me. Hear me out. Gee, listen. There's a minute 50 on it. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. I got I got Whoa. God told Joshua, he said, everywhere you go in the land that I have already given you, everywhere you put your foot, that's where you will have victory and that's where you will live. In the New Testament, your foot is your words. The word of faith is nigh unto you even in your mouth. As Joshua put his foot on the promises of God, you have to put your words on the promises of God. And everywhere that you put your mouth, you will live in victory. If you want to live in victory over addiction, you got to quit letting your mind be controlled by your flesh and what your flesh wants. And you have to put your mind on things that say, this is destroying my life and my body. This is destroying my family. This is destroying my peace. This is destroying my prosperity. This is not the way that God intended for me to live. I will set my mind on things above instead of things of what I want. My body is not my own. My life is not my own. It's not I that but live the Christ that lives in me. you got to set your mind. If you want your marriage to last, quit talking divorce. Get your marriage. Speak words of life over your marriage. If you want healing, 
you got to rest in the stripes that he already. I don't know if I'm doing any good or not. But there. Oh, help me. What do y'all play? Anybody ready to train, change the traffic flow? 